Good afternoon, uh, Małgorzata Bonikowska, the Think Tank Institute. Welcome to our book talk. We will do it in English today, as we have with us um, uh, the author of an excellent book we want to recommend to you, just, just published in Poland, 2030. It's about the future, it's about the world, and it's about the trends we can today already describe, which will shape our future world. That is the topic of our book. So today, let me welcome the author of this book, Mauro Guillen, Professor Mauro Guillen. Hello. Good afternoon. Oh, good afternoon. Thank you so much for inviting me. Um, thanks for having um, this talk with us, because um, uh, Professor Guillen works in the UK, in Cambridge. He's actually a dean of Cambridge Judge Business School. Um, he's a sociologist, political economist, we can say, um, and the vision you gave us, it's quite uh, exciting, really. Um, I would put the first question, maybe, uh, what, in your opinion, what uh, key trends, really, observed today are really the key in shaping the world of the future? Yes, thank you. Thank you for the first question. And um, I am a firm believer in that uh, we need to uh, think about uh, how different kinds of trends come together. And in particular in the book, what I argue is that right now we need to pay attention to three very important kinds of trends. We need to pay attention to demographics, so population trends, uh, because as you know, over the last uh, 20 or 30 years, we've seen many important changes, uh, such as the decline of the birth rate or the increase in life expectancy. But it's only now, over the next uh, few years to the year 2030, that we're going to see the full effects of the demographic change. The second set of trends is uh, the economy, is the rise of emerging markets, of course, with all of the implications that that will have, not just for those emerging markets, but for the entire world, for Poland, for the UK, uh, for the Americas, and so on. And then the third category of trends that I think are really, really important for us to watch very carefully has to do with technology. And of course, I'm sure that everybody listening was expecting me to say as much because technology is all around that, us, because technology is shaping not just um, our jobs and the way we learn, but also the way we shop and the way we relate to others, we communicate and everything else. Uh, but once again, the point of the book is that those trends come together. And as they come together, as they coincide in time, then they are essentially provoking, producing a, a huge transformation in the world. Well, the huge transformation is really happening, and we are, uh, you know, confronting it every day. But you wrote this book in 2020. This was the year you published it in English. Now, this year, just fresh uh, Polish version is is available. So we encourage you to uh, everyone who listens to this book talk to read this book, to buy and read this book. This book talk is live, so you can comment, you can put questions to the author as well. But I have to ask you, because we are in Poland, so of course we are now living, living and watching the situation in Ukraine. Um, how do you think the new situation which we are confronting right now because of the war in Ukraine can really um, uh, impact these trends you mentioned? Because when you wrote this book, the war was not yet you know, there. Absolutely. Uh, so look, I, I think this is a, a very important question to ask. So the book uh, did come out in the month of August of 2020. Uh, so that was about um, six months into the pandemic. Uh, I had the opportunity of changing some of the analysis in the book. And I also added a postscript, um, given the uh, impact that the pandemic was having during its initial months. Um, and now, of course, uh, in addition to still, you know, many issues that remain unresolved regarding the pandemic, what we have is a, a new wave of uh, geopolitical turmoil in the world. And of course, you are a, an expert in international relations, and I am, uh, as a political economist, uh, a part-time student of of those international relations but, a little bit. But the economy is, it, it matters a lot. If we can imagine, you know, how we want to um, absolutely build relation with Russia, for example. It's the absolutely, absolutely. And, and, and by the way, I admire the way in which uh, your country, Poland, is, is helping, uh, you know, overcome the human, humanitarian uh, crisis in, in, in Ukraine. But I think also the uh, this uh, geopolitical crisis, which is, I think, something that is going to have... Uh, you know, quite lasting effects in Europe and also beyond Europe. 
um, is also uh, something that, uh, like the pandemic, tends to accelerate pre-existing trends. So this is my main point, right? My main point is that we're going through uh, transformations um, uh, that have to do with population, that have to do with the economy, that have to do with technology. And those transformations are being accelerated. They're happening faster as a result of some of these crises, the pandemic, the invasion of Ukraine, and so on and so forth. Um, and so, in other words, my, my, my big regret about the book is that uh, given that things are getting accelerated, the future that I describe in the book uh, in the year 2030, I think now is arriving faster. And so my only regret is that perhaps the title of the book shouldn't be 2030, but rather that it should be 2028 maybe, right? Because things are happening faster. I mean, look at how, for example, uh, this crisis is making us think twice about not just the geopolitical tensions and about the loss of life, but also about energy and about uh, dependence on carbon, uh, depending, dependence on uh, sources of energy such as uh, Sorry, oil and question. natural gas. If, if I may just interact, because I, yeah. I would like really to put you the question if this is the case, I mean, if this really speeds up the Green Deal in Europe or it's the opposite happening, where we have to let make it frozen because we need coal. We need, you know, very fast reaction to what is happening. We, we need to stop Green Deal. Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. And, and uh, I think it's a little bit of both. So, for example, the fact that prices for oil and gas uh, are now very, very high, that should provide us with more incentives, right, to try to look for alternatives to that. Uh, the fact that, you know, one major geopolitical crisis such as this is sending uh, the prices of uh, energy throughout the world, not just in Europe, uh, to new heights, should also tell us that we need to have a better strategy. So my answer to your question as to whether this, in the end, will contribute to advancing the agenda for a greener future, I believe so, although you're absolutely correct that the immediate impact, like today, tomorrow, is that we need to find alternatives, right? And as you know, one of the, you know, completely um, surprising thing about uh, the developments of the last 10 days um, is that the United States, for example, is starting negotiations with Venezuela, who would have thought just a year ago, uh, from a geopolitical point of view, that the United States and Venezuela would be talking today, when for the last 15 years, they haven't really been talking at all, right? So, so there's all sorts of, um, you know, unanticipated effects, I think, of a crisis such as this. Yes, they, they are talking also with Iran, which was unimaginable. And also with Iran, that's another instance, exactly. So, uh, which is, again, something that I don't think anybody would have predicted just 10 days ago. So, in addition to the loss of life, which I think is, and the, and the refugee drama, which is, of course, the real, you know, most important impact of this crisis, right? In addition to that, I think we're going to see all of these other effects worldwide, and I think the, 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 uh, the uh, common theme for the last uh, five years since, or, or three years since the pandemic started is acceleration, right? So uh, it doesn't matter where we look, it doesn't matter you know, which topic we're talking about. What I see in the world is that things are happening at greater speed. Right. We're uh, going let's, through this process. let's come back to what you mentioned. You mentioned these three, uh, the most important um, uh, areas of change is demography, economy, and technology. But in your book, which I strongly recommend everyone to look at, we have also chapters who, which uh, give us an insight about um, a little bit, you know, uh, more detailed um, uh, trends. For example, there is a very interesting chapter about uh, how we should really learn and what we can learn from our um, our children. That it's you know this reverse mentoring. It's really happening. That the the kids could tell us much more about the future, and we should really listen to uh, this or hear this vision. You mentioned also about the uh, so-called seniors, or older generation, with, who is now, you know, these people are now not anymore old. They are absolutely, you know, a part of the this part of the society uh, which works, which is active, etc. So could you comment a little bit on this first uh, angle, demography, but in this context that we have many more 
people engaged into activity, business activity, professional activity. We have many more generations which meet in businesses, um, young people, older people. How do you imagine this 2030 as far as this? Yes, this is a, a great area, I think, for, for debate. Uh, we're living longer, uh, so therefore we have more generations on the planet living together. Uh, they are interacting together uh, also in the workplace, increasingly in universities, right, because they go back to school and so on and so forth. And as you said, I think what's really interesting right now is uh, how can we make sure that this new intergenerational dynamic is for the better rather than, you know, it uh, provoking intergenerational conflict. Because right now there are differences of opinion, right? Younger people are a little bit resentful that they have to pay high taxes to pay for the healthcare and the pensions of people who are in retirement, right? Uh, younger people are also a little bit resentful because you know, climate change is something that will affect them more than they will affect people like you and I, right? Because of our age. Uh, and yet uh, we don't seem to be doing enough. And they feel that um, you know, uh, over the last uh, 50 years, uh, those of us in our generation, we have been contributing to climate change, but now most of the uh, effects, most of the negative consequences will be felt by the younger generation. So the potential for intergenerational conflict is there. And this is something that will be, uh, we will need to, to, to manage. Uh, and I do offer some, some ideas in the book. Well, the conflict between the generations is one, but also what we are facing again, coming back to the war in Ukraine, is a massive migration. Oh. Uh, and migrations as a phenomenon in democracy will definitely happen. Absolutely. The war could provoke it, but many other uh, factors can pr provoke migration. So how no. do you see that? Absolutely. And uh, it could well be that uh, migration now, refugees and displaced uh, from Ukraine becomes even bigger than Syria, right? And as you know, Syria and Yemen, as a result of the Arab Spring, were Devastate, had devastating consequences in terms of population movements and migration and, and all the rest. Uh, I think, um, you know, quite frankly, uh, I'm hoping that this crisis will be different in the sense that uh, I see in Poland and elsewhere in Europe um, a desire on the part of the public to help uh, these refugees and displaced people from Ukraine, at least for now, right? But this is something I think you would agree with me um, that uh, politicians need to handle very carefully. As you know, immigration, and in particular, refugees, have become political puppets right? that people then use to advance their own political views. And especially extremist politicians have been using immigration and refugees as, a, as, a, an, as an excuse to propose policies that are, I think, uh, based on uh, stereotypes and based on hatred and based on the wrong assumptions, right? So I think uh, it really depends on us now, whether we make the most out of this problem and we try to address it, uh, or we uh, go back to where we were before the pandemic uh, with uh, extremist uh, you know, politicians essentially taking advantage of this as a scapegoat, as a way to justify policies that otherwise would be unjustifiable. But it's a fact that this massive migrations uh, divide us Europeans, and it may be even worse in the future because many more people could come. And of course, um, the European countries are not speaking one voice what to do with that. Uh, it's not even, you know, I'm not addressing this comment to the war in Ukraine, but I'm just generally thinking that Absolutely. we have to think about the migrations as something which will really have a very serious impact on our societies. Uh, let's go back to economy, because that's also an interesting part of your book. You mentioned some new phenomena, such as, for example, um, the phenomenon of uh, not really respecting so much uh, this uh, will of keeping uh, things, uh, accumulating things, having, you know, properties. Maybe younger generation doesn't need all that. Younger people are not so much, you know, willing to possess. They prefer to be free and travel and also work in a different way, work online, work from different places. So how would you see the, you know, the, the, the labor market in 2030? Yeah, so um, I think sharing has become um, more and more important in our culture than what it was before. Um, and if you remember, if you go back in history, uh, there was a long tradition of actually sharing among communities, for example, communities of farmers. 
Uh, but then when industrialization came, uh, we stopped sharing and uh, we've been essentially building the economy around consumption, mostly individual or family-based consumption. And this was a problem we were seeing as a huge problem of this Western societies, this, this absolutely killing us in a way. Absolutely, absolutely. But now with uh, environmental pressures, uh, with, uh, you know, uh, scarce resource, uh, resources and so on, um, you know, there are new ways of thinking about this. And as you know, all of this has started with sharing assets, such as automobiles or homes, through platforms such as Uber or Airbnb. Now we're seeing increasingly that people want to share the food that they don't eat, right? And before discarding it or throwing it into the trash, what they do is they use an app to try to share it with other people who may be in need of that of that food. Um, and I think it's also another manifestation of this is streaming, right? So you, you no longer own a CD, you no longer own a vinyl record, but you have access to the music, you have access to the songs, right? Um, so that's another way in which I think uh, we're increasingly sharing. Well, the, and trend, then finally, the, the trend is to, 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 to have something, but not to possess something, to have access. Exactly. It's access as opposed to ownership. That, that I think is the, uh, the, uh, the best uh, way to define the situation now. And it's increasingly happening. And of course, we have entrepreneurs who launch new platforms and launch new businesses that enable sharing. And look, I mean, I see it in, in, in a way that, um, you know, it's a positive in the sense that it may help us with the environment. It may help us with, um, you know, climate change, with the competition for resources in the world. Uh, so this is, uh, this is potentially something that uh, could be beneficial, although it also has some negative consequences. But, uh, but I think uh, net, uh, the net effect is, is in the aggregate is, is positive. One more thing you um, you describe in your book is uh, uh, changing the society vis-a-vis -vis women's role in professional life, in public uh, sphere. Um, we all see that women are more and more everywhere, but what will be the uh, world like in 2030 as far as men and women activity? So I think, um, as you just said, um, the incorporation of women to all the spheres of life outside of the household. So education, the labor market, companies, governments, parliaments, and so on and so forth. Um, while it's still a work in progress, right? I mean, we're still not reaching parity in many parts of the world. Uh, I think it's one of the most fundamental changes of our time. I mean, there's, there's no question uh, about it, right? And it's still, it, it must be said, it's very, very fresh, very new, even in Europe. We think it's obvious for now, but it's not a long time that women are so active in professional life. It happened in Europe after the Second World War, actually, in most of the cases. Um, oh, absolutely. But, but, but again, in some parts of the world, there's not enough progress being made, right, with the incorporation of women, with, with offering women opportunities. But, but I think it's, it's, it's such an important trend because it changes everything else, right? It changes the workplace, it changes the university, it changes, um, you know, uh, the way in which um, households, families are organized. Um, it changes so many things. It also changes, of course, fertility, right? I mean, the number of babies who are being born. It just has consequences everywhere. I think all of those changes are good, right? So don't get me wrong. I think these are transformations that are good. Um, and, and there are also changes. But there's another thing that worries me about this, uh, which I think uh, one can observe more clearly in the United States rather than in Europe, but it's also true in Europe, which is that there's also major disparities among women. So highly educated women who have career opportunities, they do really well. And increasingly, they're doing nearly as well as men. There's still discrimination, but they're doing well uh, and better over time. But then there's um, uh, another half of women who um, have not had enough access to education or they drop out from school. Uh, they're single mothers. They don't have uh, you know, as many resources. And this is especially something that affects certain population groups in the United States, for example. And so. Again, we have this world in which um, we have have inequality, which is a word that in our conversation, um, and uh, it is affecting some women more than others. Well, I think you know. Uh, of course, we describe in this case the Western world, 
But however, this trend is also seen elsewhere globally. Women really slowly, slowly in some parts of the world, but still are more and more visible in, in, in public life. And that definitely um, gives the change. We have a question already on uh, from our audience. It's the question um, which um, uh, regards again war in Ukraine. It's about uh, trends you could maybe see just uh, because this war started. If you write this book, uh, written this book right now, you know, uh, once we know that the war, uh, such a horrible war has started, would it be something new in your book? Would it be, uh, you know, designed differently, this vision of 2030? If yes, in what aspects? Well, I think um, the biggest, um, you know, now that, um, you know, two and a half years have passed since the book, uh, I'm sorry, one year, one year and a half has passed since, since the book came out in, in August of 2020. So it's been 18 months. I think the part of the book where I think um, we should probably have a little bit more debate is uh, cities, right? And I say this because of uh, the practice of remote work or hybrid work. And what's gonna happen with cities? What's gonna happen with uh, where people live, um, their commuting patterns, um, because this was something that obviously before the pandemic, we couldn't anticipate that it was going to grow so quickly, right? That so many of us, but, but again, as I was mentioning a moment ago, there's also inequality there because you see at my business school, we have 400 employees and half of them, they have to show up for work. They cannot work remotely. They have to show up for work because they're, they're attending to the building or uh, other, uh, or they do other activities. Um, so this whole process of uh, remote work or hybrid work that in the end, I think, may change the face of cities around the world, it's also a very unequal process. Some people can benefit from it, other people cannot. But the question was more referring to what's happening in Ukraine and also of this shock we are all under still. If you write the book today, would it be, you know, in any of these chapters we've discussed, would it be something which you would write differently or you see some new trends maybe, which now are appearing? Uh, one, you mentioned that everything goes faster, but maybe there is some other element of your vision which will be modified. Well, regarding Ukraine, you mean in particular? And the, the war invasion generally. The not, yeah. And the war. Yeah, well, I think, uh, you know, there's several aspects here that I find highly distressing, right? Uh, so one of them is how is it possible um, that, um, you know, even if uh, through sanctions and other means, we find a way of uh, finally bringing this to an end um, and going back to where we were before, the respect for borders, the respect for neighbors and so on and so forth. How is it possible that in order to get there, we have to go through this huge uh, loss of human life and uh, all of the refugees and the disruption of uh, their lives and think about the children and what this is going to mean for them and the, the trauma that this is probably uh, provoking young children in, in Ukraine and so on and so forth. I think the other interesting aspect is the role that fake news and fake information is playing, right? Which was so also how... visible earlier. It is not only with the war happening. We have this phenomenon. It has been a yeah. while. Absolutely. But it is playing increasingly, it has become, let me put it this way, the, the management of information through fake news and all of that has become another weapon in war, right? Uh, it has become another aspect of armed conflict and of course, cybersecurity and cyber attacks and, and all the rest, right? Uh, so, um, so that is also, um, I think, um, as I observe the events unfolding is something that comes to my mind, right? And then the other big issue, of course, um, for all of us being here in Europe, is to what extent can we still continue to be united against this aggression? Uh, and, and, can and we also forget? maybe what can, comes to my mind, in, in what scale we are able really to develop uh, still, you know, because when war happens at our borders, all the mindsets and efforts are concentrated on that. While, you know, before that, we were thinking about, as you rightly mentioned, development of new technologies, climate change, and all these big challenges, um, uh, which bring, can bring the world into a very positive um, scenario. So my question to you would be now, when we um, 
in your book have this vision which is quite optimistic i must say despite some tensions you are also illustrating uh if not if this can happen uh while we having politicians or some mm. politicians at least who really don't care about yeah. uh, this kind of uh, point of view they just want to expand their countries they are mm. ready to do disastrous decisions yeah no absolutely and look those politicians uh, don't just exist i mean they have a basis of support right uh, so they're they're leaning on uh, some segments of the society who support them and um, at the same time of course there is opposition we know there is opposition but the opposition for years has been repressed and for years um, you know it's been very difficult for uh, you know, in, in such a regime, political regime, to uh, for the opposition to play play a role, the role that it plays in a democratic uh, country. So, you know, at the end of the day, I mean, what you know, if I were to be, you know, um, like thinking about the, the gravity of the moment that we're seeing now, is this is really all about democracy at the end of the day, right? I mean, we all know that um, democracies where where there is opposition, where there is an exchange of ideas and information. They tend to be less aggressive than dictatorships, right? They tend to not uh, launch unnecessary wars, although, of course, there are exceptions, right, to that uh, general pattern. Uh, and so I think at the end of the day, this is almost like a referendum on democracy. Are we going to be able to defend democracy here, right? Uh, so that it is a form of government uh, that, I'm sorry, uh, so that it is a, a type of political regime that, that helps um you know uh, improve the well-being of people or as many people as possible around the world i think at the end of the day um here what we are what's at stake what we are discussing is the future of democracy but you rightly uh, say in your book that the future of democracy is very much connected also with this middle class larger the middle class more stable is our system because if yeah. we don't have this middle class economically well off and really large also the democracy doesn't work properly so i think it's all connected uh, because now we have to prove that in such circumstances democracies can deliver better than the authoritarian regimes and they oh, can absolutely also... absolutely uh, you know the middle class and the the stability uh, the comfort that it affords is, is really really very important and you know again there's a challenge there as i note in the book which is that well, one of the largest middle classes in the world now is the middle class in China, uh, but China doesn't have uh, a democratic um, regime. Um, now, happily, um, another very big middle class, which is growing very quickly, is India's. And in India, I think we can safely say that since independence, India has been a democracy where there is opposition and uh, there's a lot of problems in India, but it is still a democracy where there's a plurality of views and and that there are elections and uh, sometimes one party wins the election, sometimes another party wins the election. And this happens at the national level and it happens at the level of the of the uh, um, the states and the um, and the different uh, municipalities in India. So so again, yes, I completely agree with you. Um, there is that very important connection there and I, I draw it in the book, um, but we need to be careful because once again, we do see that in some parts of the world, the middle class is growing, but there are no political freedoms and there's no democracy. I think the conclusion could be, you know, that it's a very interesting uh, talk between economists, sociologists and political scientists right now, how to really bring our world into 2030 in a safe way. So uh, Mauro Vien, 2030, the most important trends which will shape our future. One more we are adding, we are confronting now um, the war, the West against the other world, not ours, with different values, maybe without any values, which can maybe destroy the peace we already uh, thought we have. So uh, to discuss this, we encourage you to read the book. And I hope we'll be able maybe to meet in 2030 to see if your vision came true. Thank you. Oh, absolutely. And I've only been to Poland once. That was before the pandemic. And I traveled throughout the country, north to south, east to west. And uh, I'm really, really fond of Poland and uh, I admire your country greatly. And again, I'd like to, as a European, uh, I would like to thank you for the very important role that you're playing right now in this crisis.
Thank you for this encouraging words. I hope that we meet in Poland. Professor Mauro Guillen, the Spanish origin, the British professor, Cambridge Business School. Thank you very much for this talk. Oh, thank you for inviting me. It's been a pleasure.